All right, thanks, April. Okay, I'm Jesse Patella Ray. Um, I am moderating this panel. Um, I have a academic background in philosophy and women and gender studies, um, and worked particularly on embodiment, female embodiment, and um, pregnancy and childbirth. Actually, it was my specialty. So I'm interested in embodiment, and we have three panelists who are going to talk about that from various angles. The first one is. <laughs> Our baby. Um, the first one is Ada Cable. Uh, she is a trans woman academic, activist, and artist working on power, labor, and gender through a variety of mediums. She writes in various modes, produces activist artworks, and care communities of trans women. Um, despite her handle, she doesn't have a PhD. She doesn't want you to be confused. <laughs> um, actually, I think I'll just go through and, but you can come up, but I will give the other two introductions so that we can do all three papers and then. After the three papers, we will do questions. All right, so the second panelist is Gabi Schaefsen. He is a recovering capitalist who's currently pursuing a PhD in art practice at UC San Diego. And he's also a regular contributor to Cyborgology. And then the last presentation that we're going to have is MD Nobel. And he is pursuing a PhD in media and communication studies at um, Gothenburg, at University of Gothenburg, and his interests lie in the field of youth, deviance, and online culture. Um, his present doctoral project is on cybersexual harassment culture and victim resistance. Um, he's attended programs in journalism, media studies, criminology, and youth studies. And in his past life, he was a journalist and a screenwriter. Okay, so we are going to start with Adam. Um. Hi, have we got slides? Video makes it to slides. Sure. Running. I think it's, it's extended right now, so. Oh, okay, weird. cool. Yeah. We are good at internet, honest. Okay. We have slides. Um, hi. Um, so I have, I'm Ado. I, again, not a doctor, art and activist. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm kind of an academic by association more than anything else. I keep on going to conferences and then, yeah, and I'm also doing a master's. Um, I'd like to apologize for the state of my slides. Um, PowerPoint has decided to um, repair them. Um, so <laughs> I have no idea what's coming right now. Um, <laughs> So, um, right, let's get our notes up. So I'm talking about trauma, disposability, abuse, and care. So we need content notes for like all of that. Could we have, hi. Um, I'm talking about tra trauma, disposability, abuse, and care. Um, they're kind of everywhere in the presentation. I can't really content note specifically for them, but I'll also be talk using specific content notes for some mentions of suicide later on in the presentation. Um, this is like, I'm going to talk about some things which trans women talk about among ourselves, trauma, trans misogyny care, and placing it in a context of materialist feminism. So like Federici mixed up with Porpentine, who's a trans woman, and like I'm kind of handling it. Um, I think this, I'm forgetting when I sl change slides on here, I don't change slides on there. Um, so I think this is going to be a good place to start. I'm going to be quoting a lot from this essay, which is Porpentine's Hot Hour Static Load, because, well, Porpentine was kind enough to take me down most of the way down this line of thinking, and it perfectly encapsulates how disposability and trans misogyny play into each other um, and create wounded bodies, or if we're going with Haraway, or Porpentine would say trans bodies, uh, trash bodies, which I'm going to argue are optimised for certain kinds of domestic labour. Um, Porpentine is uh, at Slime Daughter on Twitter. Um, her her essay is in the New Inquiry. It's and her work's in the Whitney at the moment. So go and see it if you have a chance. Because like there's a trans woman in, act, in an actual gallery, that doesn't really happen. Um, so now we get to the fun theory stuff. Um, how does trans misogyny act to create labouring bodies? 
One of the central messages of Serrano's 2007 Whipping Girl is that trans misogyny is about denying and punishing femininity and how it's created a drive to be a, a real woman. Uh, but um, this isn't a Serrano quote. This is Federici talking in 1975 about how womanhood is offered as a gift to um, by patriarchy to reward housework, to encourage housework, to extract labour from us. Uh, the real woman is a prize held for performing femininity and or, and or labour, and they're both the same thing as far as me and Federici are concerned. Trans misogyny then parallels strongly misogyny, a tool for extracting labour sp from a specific kind of woman. Um, are we talking about, while I'm talking about parallels, it's important to note that while while the prize of woman is never fully bestowed by patriarchy, certainly not to trans women, um, and it's never permanently bestowed. It's doubly denied to groups like black women, disabled women, queer women, and others. It's a, still a tool, tool of doubly extracting labor on top of those. I said I'd be using a lot of Porpentine earlier, and I'm not kidding when I say that her work is central. While there's a lot of writing about the embodied effect of trauma, um, Porpentine brings it all together to talk about how trans misogyny, abuse, and disposability interplay to force trans women to perform gender, labour, and sexuality for the benefit of non trans women. She identifies mechanisms within the queer scene designed for accountability and how they're used as threats to keep trans people in line. And when these mechanisms are inevitably deployed against trans women, they cause a deep and embodied trauma. At the core of this is the trans misogyny that allows the disposability to happen. Um, all trans femmes are precast as rapists, paedophiles and violent men invading your toilet. So when womanhood is offered, you take it and you play the part, do the labour, otherwise you're disposed of. Going back, going through this process, being subject to the eternal surveillance for cracks in your femininity, and when it eventually does crack, the disposability that comes next is a deeply embodied process. An already disrupted endocrine system gets further damaged, anxiety, PTSD and chronic fatigue set in. Like most trauma surviving populations, trans women have massively elevated uh, incidence of chronic fatigue syndrome. Processes that make a body weak, timid, afraid to engage with productive labour of queer communities. And that's a description of exactly how patriarchy sees women. We're weak, we're timid, we hide in the corner. And that's the body which is created by transmisogynistic trauma. It acts on our body as surely as hormones or surgery to mould our bodies into exactly what patriarchy would want us to be. Hot allostatic load deals quite specifically with the trauma of abuse of queer communities. But there's other ways our trauma is used to feminise our bodies, to make them into perfect labouring machines for a patriarchy. Uh, I'm going to be talking about suicide for a bit. Uh, trans communities quite simply have a terrifying suicide rate. Everyone knows someone who's died, and as, the longer you spend time in our community, the more, t the more and more of your friends die. Or you do. Uh, so trans communities spend massive amounts of time making sure our friends don't die. We're taught by our dead friends that if we don't do the care, bad things will happen. The background caring function is then deeply stuck inside the body. Noises of distress become triggers, and even mild distress begins to trigger you. You have a very a deep gut reaction to all of this, um, and it becomes undirected. Trauma doesn't make tra trauma doesn't make great things for caring very specifically about the determination of who needs care. If a man needs care, if a cis woman needs care, the trauma still kicks in. You still have this reaction which forces you to do this. Trauma is as such perfect for the extraction of labour from trans women onto other groups. The act of punishment meted out not for performing femininity become, as we saw above, a mechanism for conditioning our bodies to do care for those imparting the violence. I think it's important to note that this positions trans women in a place where building is restricted by constant maintenance. Just as domestic labour keeps women out of the workforce, prohibits building our own institutions, so does caring labour for trans misogyny, keeping us constantly dashing around fixing fires in the queer community. And at the same time, the fires we fix for people who cry on our shoulders, then go back to work, and are essential for building the institutions that traumatise us in turn. And then there's one very important mechanism which I haven't dealt with yet, and that's sex work. And I like to preface this with, like, sex work is not evil, and identifying how the phenomena of trans sex work is intertwined with trauma does not mean I'm suggesting that people are forced into it, traumatised into it. I don't want to put, put into those narratives. I'm not 
saying that about care work either for record i'm identifying how a phenomenon goes on i'm not making passing a judgment on it or suggesting a care strike a care strike would kill hundreds of trans women don't do that shit <laughs> um, <laughs> so the traumatized bodies i described above are optimized not for capital by capital not just for care work but in parallel with the eroticization of, and monstrosity of our bodies that comes with trans misogyny it's intensely useful for sex work because sex work is, after all, a form of productive emotional labour, or at least waged reproductive labour, in which mostly, though not all men, need, need someone who's practised at listening, doing the work of pleasing them. Traumatised bodies are optimised for this work, and just because it's getting paid, it doesn't mean the systems of violence that produce traumatised bodies for domestic labour aren't also formed for the purpose of producing sex working bodies. So, like... I think the trauma imparted by trans misogyny at the end of this acts as a social anti-androgen. Anti-androgens are a drug that's part of our hormone treatment that counters the effects of testosterone. Taken alone, they result in weakened energy, weakened medals, and a generally softer body. That's exactly what trans misogynistic trauma is constructed to do. Produce a body that has a violent reaction not to just to doing care, but that's unable to resist the onus of care placed upon them. In other words, trauma, t trauma produces what capital sees as a woman's body. And I'd like to note that trauma also enacts this way in cis women, except it enacts it through different mechanisms. Um, in other words, tr and the body we're trying to is. And if the body we're trying to resist this, there's another helping of violence waiting for it, and they will keep hitting you until you are dead or doing the work. So, wrapping this up. Trans femmes are placed in abusive and traumatising environments, and it's demanded that they perform femininity, which is analogous to domestic labour for, well, anyone with a materialist analysis. Um, effective labour for both the non-trans femme res residents of a space and their trans women friends who are always afraid of dying. This trauma is deeply embodied, resulting in st statistical increase in CFS in the trans population, anxiety, PTSD, and other embodied responses. These responses are, not coincidentally, the bodies that are optimised for performing reproductive and sexual labour, or producing bodies that maintain capital's perfect idea of womanhood. The responses constitute a social phenomenon that produces an embodied change in trans women and coincides with forming us into a vision of a woman that capital has, although not necessarily the cultural vision of womanhood or our own vision of womanhood. Um, thanks, I guess. I'm sorry about the mess that was my slides. Um, uh, and Dr. Cable on Twitter with a one and in place of an L. Uh, say hi, send me questions, and uh, support Porpentine. Go to the Whitney, go to slimedaughter.com, buy her stuff. Go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, have, uh, I have large type versions of my presentation if anybody would want some. Okay, so I, I was in this room yesterday and I couldn't see like the bottom half of every slide. So I kind of pushed everything up and then I put it on this morning and realized that that light is just negating half of the other half of the slide. So um, we'll do our best here. That's not gonna work. All right, uh, also in the program it notes that I'm, I worked on this with my colleague Zach, uh, Zach Kaiser. He's on the live stream right now. So can everyone just say, hey Zach? Hey Zach. All right, we'll assume he sees that in about 12 minutes. All right. Um, so, okay, let's do this. This is the Pavel Norway Dream Machine. It was built by myself, Zachary Kaiser, and also Sophie Hodara, and is inspired by the work of Dr. Pavel Norway, a visionary, if misguided, doctor from the mid 19th century London, and attempts to recreate his experiments using modern technologies, specifically those of the quantified self. Per Deborah Lupton, the term quantified self overtly refers to using numbers as a means of monitoring and measuring elements of everyday life and embodiment, allowing individuals to engage in self-tracking and analysis through the collection of data about everyday activities, for example, walking and sleeping, as well as other data such as your DNA. Contemporary popular culture's foray into the quantified self as movement is often credited as an informal meeting of 28 individuals at the home of Kevin Kelly. 
Kelly, a noted neoliberal technologist, was also founding editor of Wired magazine and author of 1999's The New Rules for the New Economy. It is no surprise, then, that so much of the quantified self-discourse represents, the neoliber represents neoliberal tenets, Fitbit's assertion that you find your fit, or that only Fitbit gives you the freedom to get fit your way. But let's go back for a second to the 19th century. If my slides will do so. Dr. Norway's brief 1841 treatise, Computable Transformation of Human Qualities to Those of a Visible Dream Memory, is an obscure but intriguing thesis on the possibility of inferring dream content from the behavior of a subject after he or she has awakened. Developed over a hundred years before the discovery of REM sleep, computable transformation argues that human bodies produce residual energy, a type of corpuscular molecule that emits all day. He believed that this energy could be collected and measured, including its velocity, coming off the body, temperature, etc., which would make it possible to reconstruct the prior dreams. In our hybrid transmedia performance exhibition, we introduce our subject to Pavel Norway briefly before we then ask them to sit on our examination table. We attach a Fitbit, EEG, and muscle sensor to their bodies, we ask them a few questions about their sleep habits, and then we ask them to relax. Generally speaking, quantified self-devices collect information, be it via a chip that measures movement or sensors that measure uh, electrical current and outputs computer-readable data, and that is ones and zeros, right? So for instance, here is not a day's worth of Fitbit data that I intercepted between my Bluetooth device and my laptop. Uh, let's see if it's on the next slide. Nope. Great. If <laughs> If you wanted to, and I did want to, you could turn this data into another type of file on a computer. But let's be perfectly honest. You understand this black space as much as you would understand the, the hex data that you would be seeing on the screen unless you are superhuman in some sort of way, which is another panel altogether. Um, so here is, is one month of wearing and downloading data from the Fitbit. Um, I have over 70,000 bytes, which I was able to build an image with. It's 88 by 268 pixels. And so the hex data represented in these 23,584 pixels are no more concrete or abstract than the values which I had intercepted from the Fitbit. They are, in fact, the same exact values. So each color is made up of um, three bytes of uh, Fitbit data, which I intercepted between the Bluetooth thing from my wrist and my computer. And then when you put it into an image, those become colors. There it is, the hex data. All right. Um, where should we go? Should we go to page three? Referring back to the dream machine, using live data from our subject, we are able to, within seconds, produce what we put forward as a representation of their most recent dream state. In this case, we wrote an algorithm to convert our data into search queries for the Vine API, as well as into audio files. I'm going to play a video. We'll see if the volume is either too loud or too low, because it won't be in between. And so what you see uh, uh, here and what you hear is um, our subject, Erin, uh, had her data collected and then we're feeding it through a Max MSP patch and you can't see the visuals, but there are some. Um, if you go to my website, this video is much clearer and you're hearing sort of a sonification of that data as well. So the connection between Dr. Norway's work and the contemporary QS movement is strong. Right? Both seek to infer a macro-level understanding of a body by measuring its micro-qualities. Dr. Norway never fully implemented his theories, though he did produce a number of etchings which sought to translate collected data points into visualizations. So he would collect this data off the subject, he would get high on opium, and then he would start sketching. In our project, we draw a correlation between the absurdity and pseudoscience of contemporary QS technologies and Dr. Norway's work. We employ the story of Dr. Norway as a fable of sorts, a rhetorical device intended to operate as a cautionary tale. Per Lupton again, the QS movement is an ethos and apparatus of practices that has gathered momentum uh, in today's world of sensor-laden wearable devices. It privileges a purely quantitative understanding of the world, eliminating from a consideration of existence those aspects of life that cannot be quantified or that companies choose not to quantify. We argue that this rationalist proposition is absurd, reductive, and ultimately dangerous for the human condition. 
The Pavel Norway Dream Machine aims to underscore the absurdity of the QS movement as well as the pseudoscience of many of the technologies its adherents use. Why, you might ask, am I doing this? Well, my diagnosis came from a doctor at Massachusetts General Hospital in August of 2010. She asked about my family and my love life. She pinched my skin and prodded my scars. She took copi copious notes, and then she wrote up a thorough report with her verdict, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, a genetic collagen deficiency. The diagnosis was no real surprise. My sister, who's 12 years older, uh, was diagnosed by the same doctor a year or so earlier, and Ellie's EDS had progressed beyond my condition at the time. Her chronic joint pain, stretchy skin, and immunodeficiency were much more pronounced and took a more significant toll on her daily life than on mine. Dr. Lin, however, could not have been more pleased with her findings because as a geneticist, she had siblings present with similar symptoms at varying stages of severity, and that was like a gold mine of study fodder for her. Until August of 2010, Ehlers-Danlos looked like this. Day long or more pain after particularly strenuous exercise and scars that look like cigarette paper, showing off veins that bulge despite my non-muscular stature, skin that stretches further off my muscles than most. To be fair, I felt exactly that way when I was going through this stuff, um, and still do. Limbs that bend awkwardly. A few weeks after my 18th birthday, my lung collapsed spontaneously. Later that year, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, the kind of gastrointestinally-based immunodeficiency often associated with EDS. For the years before, and nearly a decade after, I had simply considered myself an unlucky but relatively typical Ashkenazi Jew. In fact, I was often told, like, yeah, that sort of thing happens to skinny white Jewish boys. <laughs> but now, there was a name for all this. There was a doctor's report, a WebMD entry, most importantly, there was certainty that something in my DNA was not quite normal. In The Taming of Chance, Ian Hacking dedicates an entire chapter to the word normal. He notes the word's etymological roots in geometry. It meant perpendicular, at right angles, orthogonal. Orthodontists make your teeth right. Orthopedists make your bones and muscles right. Critically, however, he points to sort of the magical nature of the word. He says one can use the word to say how things are, but also to say how things ought to be. Look, after all, at the normal distribution on the familiar bell curve. Collections of data points, they sort of, on a single metric, fall into this predictable pattern that just looks like a big lump, and we stick a pole in the middle, and we call that average. In 1889, Francis Galton, father of eugenics and all-around bag of dicks, wrote about his love for the normal distribution. I was hoping that one would land well. Specifically, he was excited about how, it, how the normal distribution let him make sweeping generalizations about large populations based on a few bodily measurements. Of course, these generalizations were by no means innocuous. He argued that the human race could be moved further and further to the right of the bell curve, that is, to the exceptional, by simply breeding out the ones on the left, that is, the deficient. His argument was for forced sterilization and selective breeding. Some of his most enthusiastic followers were a bit more aggressive in their attempts to cleanse the human race. And I hope you don't think I'm trying to sanitize Nazism. I think I'm just sick of seeing pictures of swastikas. Uh, but, Gabi, you ask, you're not actually about to suggest that the quantified self and the Nazis have a lot in common, are you? You may also ask if that cat is eating that Fitbit, and the answer is yes. <laughs> to the second question, not the, not the first one. If all has gone as planned, I've got about six and a half minutes left on this presentation, uh, but I'm cracking too many jokes. Um, but that means that I, I have around, so, so uh, and now I lost my place because of that <laughs> joke. Um, I actually do have a really good, like, strong genealogical relationship between eugenics and the quantified self, um, a relationship that runs along technologies of governmentality, as elucidated by Michel Foucault in his 1978 talks to the Collège de France. And if you're playing Theorizing the Web Bingo and you have the Michel Foucault square, you're welcome. <laughs> or... I could tell you that I'm going to actually make that exact argument on the Cyborgology blog over the coming weeks, and that you should check that out. And then... I could compare the way the quantified self works to the ideas of philosopher Elaine Scarry from her 1985 The Body in Pain. In the book, she explores the relationships between the torturer and the tortured to explore the relationship between the feeling and the expression of pain. 
She suggests that when the sentient facts of a person's suffering manifest in the visible world, that is when subjects scream, bleed, or otherwise convey their suffering, the torturer has successfully objectified his subject's body, and he is now in control. Scary's torturers, be they actual pain-inflicting individuals or metaphorically arbiters of a central ideology or cultural construct, the torturers translate the intangible into the tangible, forcing its reconstruction in the sheer material factualness of the human body, borrowed to lend that cultural construct the aura of realness and certainty. And so this is how the quantified self works, as it offers a sheer material factualness of our normal or abnormal bodies. Famously, and like perfectly, Galton and Charles Darwin were first cousins. <laughs> and if we go back to the taming of chance, Galton's 1877 speech to the Royal Institution in London is actually used by Hacking as an epigraph to a chapter entitled The Autonomy of Statistical Law. And here, Galton discusses normal distributions in relation to Darwin's evolution. He speaks of the ordinary genealogical course of race and how outliers die away at the margins, the scanty remnants of all exceptional members revert to mediocrity. Statistical laws, Galton says, show us that natural selection does not act by carving out each new generation according to a definite pattern on a Procrustean bed irrespective of waste. They also explain how small a contribution is made to future generations by those who deviate widely from the mean, either in excess or deficiency. And they enable us to discover the precise sources when the deficiencies in the produce of exceptional types are supplied and their relative contributions. Hacking begins this chapter with this passage in order to illustrate, as he writes, that statistical laws have become, uh, become autonomous when they could be used not only for the prediction of phenomena, but also for their explanation. So if natural selection expects a regression to the mean, or in the parlance of Francis Galton, a reversion to mediocrity, then the exceptional must be jettisoned. Normalization as survival of the fittest, one of neoliberalism's most important ideologies. Pain, on the other hand, is exceptional. Chronic illness is an outlier. These are conditions that resist the mean and as such resist expression in systems where regression is favored. Whatever, pardon? Whatever pain achieves, writes Elaine Scarry, it achieves in part through its unshareability, and it ensures this unshareability through its resistance to language. The standard off-the-shelf Fitbit has no language to express a condition such as Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. It becomes the role of the diagnosed to find a means to express their situation. The communications philosopher James Carey, who uh, Jay Rosen mentioned last night on the big stage, he notes that things can become so familiar that we no longer perceive them at all, Art, however, can take the texture of a fabric, the design of a face, and wrench these ordinary phenomena out of the backdrop of existence and force them into the foreground of consideration. And you notice I read this like my first year of my MFA, which was many years ago, and I was so excited. I gave a big star and an exclamation point. <laughs> Uh, Carrie's position here drives the work of my project, as I, the artist, seek to reframe the otherwise mundane data being collected about my quantified self into a means to raise questions about power, meaning, and identity not found in many other QS-related discourse. The importance of discourse, and even resistance around and to the quantified self movement, needs to be rooted in the dangers of normalization. Resistance to the tide upon which movements like QS are riding is a complicated goal, but that is the goal. The Pavel Norway dream machine and my raw data images are parts of an interrogation. They argue for a view of the quantified self movement as indicative of a computationally mediated culture which is, despite endless rhetoric to the contrary, jettisoning the non-normal. And we're quickly learning the power of that jettisoning. We see a movement predicated on violent normativity working from one of the most important offices in this country. Whereas the neoliberal project of which the quantified self is a critical piece is the empowerment of the individual through the exploitation of the collective, I believe in the responsibility of artists and scholars to empower the collective through the education of the individual. Thank you very much.
Was, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk here. Uh, this is really wonderful to be here in this city and in this vibrating conference for the second time this year. And uh, I'm really delighted to be here. You know. So today I'm going to talk about how uh, and what um, news is constructing about revenge porn and how it is constructed. And we can see there are different types of uh, news uh, coming up in, in today's media. Sometimes it can be about countries taking actions uh, against um, revenge porn, enacting laws. And sometimes it's about tech corporations, what, what kind of uh, um, uh, policies they are taking to support the victims. And also it, it can be a sheer human interest story when uh, it is about a victim, her sufferings. And also we see uh, media creating the, uh, constructing the magnitude of the problem. So we can see that uh, it's obviously uh, media is playing a crucial role co in constructing our knowledge about this particular phenomenon. But we also have to be critical about this knowledge construction because uh, when it is made available through uh, use of language, then we have to uh, think that if it is a discursive construction, then it is not neutral. And uh, it can constitute and regulate subjectivities, different identities, and then it can favor one over the other uh, within a particular social context. So that's why uh, I'm interested to know what uh, knowledge is constructed in media, in news media about revenge porn and how it is constructed. So before I present my own study, I would like to give you some idea about what existing literatures are talking about this, uh, this particular topic. We can see there's a tendency of uh, blaming the media, uh, blaming the victims in news. And uh, why is that? Because in, in general in the society, it is considered the production and the exchange of uh, these contents are done for mutual uh, pleasure and uh, if there is any uh, harmful uh, consequence or uh, suffering, then it is uh, thought to be a natural consequence. And also the focus is uh, on the victim, what he or she has done or has, hasn't that uh, led to their um, suffering or abuse. And it is also uh, like uh, we blame the victims, but not the offender who is committing this kind of crime. And also there is another uh, tendency of media to disregard the magnitude of this problem because uh, if we compare this with uh, intimate partner violence, then we see that uh, there's a similarity also, uh, like it is not taken seriously or it is only viewed as a misdemeanor, and not a felony. And since the victim has the misfortune to uh, know her perpetrator. So uh, it is only thought to be their isolated problem, uh, only a victim-centered problem, not a universal problem in society. And particularly, I can give you one example uh, f from a recent study by, uh, by Fairbairn in uh, 2015. Uh, and he, uh, his sample articles uh, uh, were failing to adequately capture the ordeal of the victims. Now, there is a problem here. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, it's, it's not the women who are being victims, but if we repeatedly uh, talk about female victimization, then it can uh, also strengthen gender stereotypes. Um, like uh, men are playing the role of a predator and the female victims are uh, falling prey. So there can be a s sense of victimization um, affecting their uh, normal sexual behavior online, but uh, there, this is a particular strategy taken by media uh, because that relies on the, our established knowledge about a phenomenon, what kind of uh, pro uh, problem orientation we have about this subject. So mass media try to relay that. And also it can be taken positively when it isn't about a new social problem, then media tries to uh, frame the victims in order to gain institutional support or legal reformation. Mm. 
but both these kind of criticisms are, uh, in my view, ignoring um, one recent uh, uh, development in the media landscape, which is, uh, you know, inclusion and integration of uh, uh, content created by bloggers, activists, or ad even advocacy agencies. And according to Minich, uh, this is a pro-feminist journalism taking place because now we see that. Uh, there are separate sections in, in most of the news uh, outlets that uh, deals with issues of uh, women's problems and what kind of solutions there should be in terms of legal reformation. Uh, so I see uh, there is a possibility to accommodate um, competing and contrasting discourses within the broader media discourse. So my present study is about uh, thematic analysis of 99 news stories. I couldn't make it round figure. Um, but I have uh, collected them, uh, which were published uh, over a period of five years, from 2012 to 2016. And these were published uh, in New York Times, Fox News, NBC News, and CNN. And I have found three major themes emerging from the data. So we can see there's a kind of definition in um, in in news media, they they just um, don't only re report about the phenomenon, but they give us uh, what is uh, revenge porn. It's interesting that they still call it revenge porn, but I don't see any revenge taking place uh, using porn. But it's it's like um, it shouldn't be called porn. Of course, uh, we have to think about what other actors are uh, involved here. There are money-making schemes. Uh, by the website operators. There are hackers involved here. So it, sh it shouldn't be only called revenge porn, but we maybe need to think uh, um, another time and we maybe redefine it. So I have given uh, presented here three examples. Uh, here you see that media is giving us uh, the background, what leads to the, such actions. And sometimes it's just about uh, definition. I think it's uh, has become a bit clumsy because maybe some of you cannot see the uh, end of this slide. Uh, but here we see that uh, the offline uh, damages it can cause, that sometimes it's about extortion, it can be blackmail, and sometimes in worst case, it can be about abatement to suicide. So here I, uh, I'm being a bit descriptive. Uh, these are my thematic categories. Here you can see in a um, significant number of uh, articles, women were presented as the victim, and um, news media tries to depict it as a female victimization. And the characterization of, the, uh, of these victims, like they are, they are naive and they, they are unsuspecting, uh, so they cannot be blamed for their actions. And we also see uh, repeated mentioning of ensuing damages. Uh, reports describing uh, wh what kind of consequences they face in their both online and offline life. Uh, yes, and news also uh, does advocacy. They provide the victims with information uh, where they can go, what kind of uh, legal uh, uh, assistance they can get from different institutions. So this is the first thematic uh, um, category, uh, first theme, which is, you know, the revenge porn is constructed in uh, news within a gendered frame. It recognizes uh, this problem as a non-consensual uh, sharing and distribution of intimate images, but it is only presented as a victimization of women. And they give uh, the uh, social uh, groups they belong to, these women, for example, wives, girlfriends, you know, uh, maybe ex-partner, teachers, professionals, and like I said, the characterization uh, of these women as naive and unsuspecting. And these actions are carried out by men, their former partners, boyfriends, even hackers. And they have a malicious intention to, you know, sexually shame them and making profit, uh, damaging reputation. And uh, yes, uh, on the one hand, we have uh, victims in need of institutional support. On the other hand, we have uh, offenders who need criminal punishment. So there is a gender uh, binary here. Now, my second theme is uh, 
you know, the revenge porn is uh, being criminalized in news. You can see th three different types of uh, uh, categories, uh, if I can uh, put them uh, in groups. One is uh, revenge porn is uh, framed as a crime or to be a crime, and may more and more states are going to uh, criminalize revenge porn. And then we have uh, a deterrent uh, uh, effect in news that it, it mentions about uh, investigating authorities, what charges can be uh, brought against the uh, offenders, and the punishment or penalties they will face. And then news also goes to uh, investigate uh, in depth and report about the other actors who are uh, involved in this. For example, the third party content distributors, uh, the website operators, and if they should have the criminal liability. Um, because previously uh, they had a, a legal impunity, these website operators, but now we can see there are uh, laws that can, uh, we can uh, try the, uh, website operators as well, and uh, some of uh, such um, website operators have been uh, in, the, in jail now, by now. So uh, if I uh, analyze that uh, um, those categories, then we can see that revenge porn is framed as a crime. It has a deterrent effect, and it goes in depth uh, with investigation of uh, involvement of uh, other actors and their criminal liabilities. And the third theme is about uh, critiquing existing laws and uh, po uh, policies against revenge porn. Of course, news media criticizes existing laws, uh, the deficiencies we have in, uh, in legal institutions across the globe. Uh, but at the same time, it also uh, provides an alternative uh, discourse that if it should uh, conflict against the uh, against people's right to freely express themselves or free speech right which is, which is given by the first amendment and news media has its stake there because whenever it is a uh, it is a politician doing these kind of actions then media uh, scandalize their uh, uh, whole incidents you know and uh, then it be becomes a big news then, uh, and also about celebrities. They, they provide information, they provide their pictures. Then uh, it's not about harassing anyone, but it's about, you know, um, for the benefit of uh, broader population, we need to criticize the politicians. So news media brings the, their scandals in front of us. Yeah. I'll just be finishing. And also another thing is uh, reporting about tech corporations' uh, policies on revenge porn. And this is a very recent change that uh, um, now the uh, discourse of responsibility is shifting from, from the self towards other institutions. Not only the legal institutions, but also the corporations who are making money by publishing content. So I'll just conclude here, and uh, we can see the focus is also on the offenders and the other actors like website operators, not only the victims. So we can't really say that it's always about framing the victims, but it's also about other actors, uh, particularly the offenders. And also news media is uh, making this uh, agenda to uh, define it as a crime, and not only um, mere victim blaming. And we, we also have seen that the responsibility to protect self is being challenged and negotiated by increasing demand of uh, legal reformations or uh, supportive uh, policies by the tech corporations. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Uh, I realized at the outset that I forgot to tell you that um, Ashley won't be able to make it today, so we are one to talk short. So I would like to open things up now for questions. Yes, I have a question for, tell me your name again, I'm sorry. 
Nabil. Nabil. Nabil? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you were saying that uh, you felt like revenge porn shouldn't be categorized as porn. So then what would you say it should be categorized? Like what were you, like what do you think is going on there? Yes. Um, I think it's a non-consensual um, sharing and distribution of intimate images, but then you need to define it as online harassment, not as a revenge porn. You know, it doesn't give us the proper sense. It can be called non-consensual uh, distribution of sexualized images, not porn, not revenge. Right. Doesn't that act to hide? Like, obviously, a lot of porn is used in very ethical ways, but doesn't that? It is certainly consumed in a pornographic manner. It's consumed in a very similar way. Many of its patterns of production and distribution and consumption are similar. And are you going to suggest that porn must be consensual for you to call it porn? And if so, does this not act to just hide the fact that lots of material which is pro pro used pornographically and produced for pornographic purposes is produced in a highly violent manner? as you identified? I, I think uh, just because it is consumed and um, used as uh, for pornographic purposes that doesn't make uh, it a porn because it is more about the consent. Uh, this is very important. Uh, if it is not consented then uh, if we call it uh, porn then it, we are like being uh, we are talking in their terms who are doing it not from a neutral position. So, so how yeah. do you define porn then? Me? Yeah. Uh, it it can be sexualized uh, content used for satisfac uh, people's satisfaction uh, in a different way, sexual satisfaction or gratification. But here in this case, uh, we need to think about the harassment, uh, mm -hmm. the magnitude of the harassment. So that is more important than a bunch of people are having gratification of this uh, content, it's not so important. But maybe uh, we have to think more about the people who are suffering because of this. So we have to redefine it. So, um, Content Notes CSA. We have a very traditional way of talking about violent pornography and there's a massive tradition of understanding pornography produced of children who cannot consent as pornographic material. And there's a tradition of feminist scholarship which I have significant and massive problems with significant parts of it, which is designed to understand the violence of some kinds of pornography. And there's efforts led by sex workers to do the same thing and we're not speaking from a neutral position here we're speaking as the people who produce it as survivors of sexual abuse and I don't see why you're seeming to stand on top of these people who aren't speaking from a neutral position and taking your neutral position and putting it over us no, I'm, I'm not putting it over anyone I just uh, give him given my opinion that's what asked to me that what I think about it and uh, I just said about what I think. Um, I'm not uh, going to put <laughs> anything on anyone. Mm, yeah. Alright, yes. Um, I had a question for Zach. Uh, Gabi. Gabi, uh, or like, sorry. My apologies. Ask sorry. our friends, we're the same person. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I thought it was important uh, to the, the quantify itself yeah. has been taken up in education quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So I go in and I work with teachers and they're always wanting to, you know, how can we how can we use this data in my science class, my math class? And and I'm wondering, I really liked your end, then your uh, where you said, you know, we need to educate about this, we need to take a critical perspective. So you had that slide which connected Golton to Darwin, which uh, you know is from his cousin. But if you actually go in the reverse, Darwin's grandfather was uh, one of the most prominent abolitionists of his time, and there's a pretty strong case that uh, uh, Darwin uh, was fighting the polygenesis to you know say that we all came from one spot. So you could say that you know natural selection, Darwinian theory could be used for social justice, mm -hmm. just as the DNA uh, Innocence Project has been used for social justice. Mm -hmm. So what can I tell these teachers who, um, who want to bring in this uh, quantified self into their classroom mm -hmm. um, uh, that would allow for a critical perspective to be taken, but also use the data in a way for uh, to 
you know, help us understand the world in a more socially equitable or socially just way? Okay, so um, for the live stream, um, the question um, was how can something that I'm sort of painting in quite a nefarious, you know, way be used for good, effectively? I mean, like, well, yeah? Specifically, specifically in education and, and yeah, yeah. for social justice, sure. Well, first of all, um, you know, that, that Darwin was trying to say we all come from the same place is, seems like erasure in, in a lot of ways, and it's, it's actually utilized by eugenicists to say, like, look, we all come from the same place, and look where we ended up. You should be doing what we do, the white people. But that's not your question. Um, mm, uh, yeah, I mean, look, I love, you know, the, the Melvin Kranzenberg, right? Technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Um, th th this, this, is, this is... My argument is about systems of technology and the way that, that power works within them, right? And so... Yes. Is there a way to use data and and quantified content to for for social justice? Absolutely. Right. I mean, absolutely. You you you, you could absolutely look at a lot of um, you know very heavily quantified narratives on on you know prison or you know crime. Right. The and 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 use that for social justice for sure. Um, what I'm trying to, to do as an artist and a scholar is to empower, again, like what I said at the end there was about empowering the collective through the education of the individual, um, as opposed to sort of convincing each individual that they can be exceptional and the only way to do so is by, you know, sort of jettisoning the deficient. So, uh, you, I don't know, this is hard. A car can drive me to the airport or the hospital. A car can also hit me and kill me, right? So I'm not going to say don't, don't do cars. I'm not going to say, like, don't go... Well, I will say don't go and buy a Fitbit. That'd be awful. But, but you know, I, I'm not trying to pass that sort of judgment. Um, you should, yeah, I, sorry. I guess I'm rambling at this point. My answer is, yeah, it could totally be used in that context. I would hope, however, that the educators using it um, would be well informed on sort of the the uh, cultural and systemic uh, issues of power within them. Is that fair? Towards like open source type of Yeah, I mean, I, you know, one thing I didn't say at the beginning here is that I'm going to talk about corporate uh, devices, corporate marketed devices, but I don't know that there is that big of a difference than like self-trackers who, who count their steps on their own, you know, using like a, a like Benjamin Franklin supposedly right poked holes in a piece of paper for however many good things he did in a day. Like it's the same thing. It's the same story. But there, right, individuals are doing that. Open source quantify itself again is being driven by like this idea that if we quantify, we will be better. If we turn into numbers, we are true and we are understood. Um, and so that, again, another panel. Other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of this. So this is for you. And um, if you covered it, sorry about that. <laughs> I'll probably say yes either way. <laughs> I was wondering if in your, in your research making this distinction between people who choose to self-track and those who must do it for medical reasons and what the outcomes of that might be and what if you take into account the kind of, um, um, I guess, perceptual changes that come about through being compelled to self-track. Excellent, excellent question about individuals who uh, choose to self-track or those who are compelled to do so uh, for purposes of care. Um, there's a project in coming out of Children's Hospital in Cincinnati called the C3N Network, uh, Collaborative Chronic Care Network, and they um, are trying to create what they call N of One, trying to enact N of One studies um, among patients with actually Crohn's and colitis as well as chronic pain, um, and they're, they're using a lot of self-tracking technologies. Um, I'm. I don't, uh, first of all, I'd like to really spend a lot of time looking at that project. It's actually something I'm going to try to to pitch for next academic year. But, um, you know, I think that it, we've got a lot of questions about pathological and normal, about um, how, you know, maybe the world is not that great for people in pain because it's built for people not in pain. Um, maybe the, the world considers, you know, individuals as uh, abnormal when 
there's no such thing, right? So yeah, I think it's a really, really good question, and I don't by any means have a good answer for it, except to say um, it's something we, we should totally talk about. Why why are these projects being compelled to use self-tracking technologies? Why, right? Um, I'm not saying it's bad reasons. I'm saying I want to know why, and in that case, we can talk again about the systems of power that operate within. Is that fair? Yeah, and I was also thinking um, kind of about kind of day-to-day -day monitoring of. Um, I like, have thinking type one di diabetes, mm -hmm. like kind of mm -hmm. having to monitor continually, being compelled to do so for kind of health reasons, and you're kind of already within a network of uh, like a technology of power that has a benefit, of course, mm -hmm. if you don't mm -hmm. monitor that's disastrous. But then um, I don't know. I'm just thinking about this, the difference between the opt-in and the, the compulsion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a it's a good question, and again, I think it's indicative of much larger cultural questions um, that I'm not putting that on the patients, right, or the individuals who have to do the tracking. I'm not saying, like, what, you got to take insulin tracking every hour, figure out how to eat differently, right? That's not, not what I'm saying. Um, but I think that it does, it's a really, really good area to look at. Yeah, thank you for that question. Other questions? I actually have a question for Nabil about, um, I'm trying to... Um, when you set up the three different ways of like that the media is depicting revenge porn, I was curious when you talked about like the gendered aspect of it and um, women appearing as like victims of this. If you think that there's something like problematic or untrue about that uh, sort of gender schema, and what like benefit undermining that or changing that would be, given that like women are disproportionately like affected negatively by that. I, I think to some extent this uh, this this is uh, relaying the uh, reality. Mo uh, I'm, my previous study was about uh, uh, the revenge porn content, and I've seen that 80 uh, more than 80 percent of victims were women. Mm -hmm. So this is obviously the reality. But when uh, for for the legal definition, there is no such uh, thing like uh, shaming of women using uh, sexualist content these phrases are not in the legal definition then it it's only about people but media does that you know phrasing that kind of categorization that it's only uh, against women there is no uh, other problem then that it can create some kind of uh, fear in women uh, and you can see uh, in media sexting is um, depicted as, as a very normal thing but if you really study the uh, practices of sexting, then you can see that women uh, sext different ways. It's like you can in, compare with uh, wearing a hijab when they don't s show their face because uh, they fear that something uh, bad can happen if they are identified in some social context, not everywhere in the globe. But in sexting, they, can, they are also covering their face or maybe sometimes it's just a headless pic. So isn't it also about uh, doing hijab while sexting? So that's the thing. When you repeatedly talk about female victimization, it will create some kind of uh, fear. Are you suggesting that the, the media, by framing this as like victimization of women, are, is creating like fear in women? Like they yes, uh, that's what I'm saying. But there, if, if there is only five incidents where males were victimized. That should also come in, in the later pa uh, paragraphs in the news. But you, uh, in my sample news, there was no such uh, cases where uh, the reports said that males can be also victimized in the same way. Where males, other males are uh, victimizing the uh, male victims. That can also happen. When women can victimize other women, that can also happen. But it's always in the gendered binary when the men as the offender and female as the victim. So that's the problem. I think Adam wanted to chime in. But it is a problem which mostly consists of men attack. Like, we talk about domestic violence as a feminist issue and as an issue which affects women, like, because it mostly affects women and it's mostly perpetrated by men. Why don't, why are you opposed to talking about, why are you opposed to seemingly amplifying other elements of this discourse at, to where they are beyond. What's the advantage here? So I didn't What's the tactical advantage of talking about men? 
Yeah, that was my question. Like, mm -hmm. why would we want to undermine that when actually women are being disproportionately victimized by this? It's also about, um, it's very similar with other sexual violence because in feminist literature, you can find that uh, some feminists also um, um, you know, contradict with this strategy to show women as the victim because it, it can um, you know, reify their subordinate position in the society. And um, there are different types of uh, uh, interpretation you can make out of it. Sometimes if you n need the institutional support and legal reformation, then you have to be strategic and you have to show like not um, you have to but maybe media does it or mm -hmm. people who are you know responsible holding uh, institutional um, positions they do it as a strategic uh, uh, in a strategic way in order to ch uh, make changes in the society and I don't know why they don't uh, talk about men because if it was uh, never a men's issue then uh, why it is coming in the academia right now, uh, now these days that men are also being victimized so it's it's a problem that's why it is uh, coming up and but the problem is uh, if you uh, I, will, I will just you know repeat if you constantly talking about uh, uh, victimization of females then it can create some kind of uh, fear in, in them that's it did you want to add something like women to or people talking about violence against women doesn't create might create a fear in of again of women for about being hurt but that's because women are being hurt it's not because the the, the macro effect here is of violence against women it's a misogynist violence and when we're trying to center men or at least move men towards the center in this discourse isn't aren't you acting to erase that I'm just saying, um, if you have the, um, I mean, the dominant perspective in the news is uh, victimization of women, then it is the problem because they are, part are reporting about a particular uh, practice that can harass men, women, transgender, anyone. And the offenders can be anyone, the victims can be anyone. When the report is about this phenomenon, then it 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 shouldn't be just about uh, within this gendered frame. That's what I'm saying. But in the uh, there are different sections in the news uh, when it is about when it is about uh, portraying women's problem in general. Then it it can be also reported as as their problem. But that news is not uh, about uh, that was not published in the uh, uh, you know women women's uh, page, but it was published in the tech page, and then. Uh, if you just repeatedly talk about this uh, female victimization, th that's my problem. Um, yeah. yeah. Except, yeah, except the fact you that women are victimized by this, and the uh, the way in which they're like impacted is completely different in a patriarchal system than the way that men are impacted by the same sort of like images being uh, uh, distributed. You keep on talking about can, like that doesn't seem to be the issue, which I don't think either of us are talking about we're talking about what does happen and that is that the vast majority of these cases are this and that it is a like you you must know the statistics much better than me but it is it must be single figures percentage of these are cases perpetrated against men it's very uh very less percentage that is happening against men uh, so far media is concerned but um, I don't know uh, I have presented the data and you have the uh, liberty to critically examine the data and that depends on your own interpretation and you know it, it can vary person to person researcher to researcher uh, that's it uh, for my view uh, I was uh, I viewed it as a problem, but maybe in, in your uh, view it's not a prob uh, problem. Yeah. Maybe that's the thing, just a different view, you know. Did you want to ask a question? Yeah, um, this is a comment more so than a question. Um, and just, you know, talking about how language is powerful, right? And, you know, when we have conversations about things like violence um, and when we have conversations about 
you know, content warning, things like self-harm and suicide, being able to address these issues and name them for what they are is actually something that is very empowering. Um, and, you know, from my perspective and my field, I can actually uh, be able to show, you know, some documentation based on that as well. So, it, you know, it, it is important to frame this, I do think, you know, for, from the perspective of, of gender, because that gives the voice to the people who are being affected by it. I, and, you know, which is not to say that violence does not take place against other genders. It's not, it's not an erasure. It's just, you know, allowing to, to speak for the fact that, you know, this is, this is what's happened, that this is commonplace, right? Um, when we talk about suicide intervention, um, you know, it's actually recommended as a best practice to put it on the floor and say, you know, are you talking about suicide? Can we make sure that this conversation is about suicide? And in the same way, you know, I think that that context applies here. Did you have a question in the back? Just that I would talk to Nabil. Nabil. If any of the researchers came across the phenomena where, for instance, in the situation we're talking about, so we can't hear something going on. We're talking about where other genders, men, are talking about sexual assault, where one of the reasons that they don't talk forward is because of the social misunderstanding that this is not something that happens to. Men. And so there's still this like very particular relationship between how we understand sexual violence and how that's associated specifically with the female identity. So doesn't that in and of itself sort of suggest that this is a relationship we're talking about? Yeah, it's also about you know stereotypical um, gender role. You know, when you men are not stereotypically. Um, expected to talk about gender uh, or sexual harassment by women or by other men maybe it, it it they don't want to be in the inferior position so it's, it's about a stereotypical uh, idea about gender roles maybe in from that perspective you are right but um, i'm not really uh, here to comment on that but I am saying that these are the major themes in uh, in these reports, and you can examine these themes in, from different critical perspectives. That's it. Just about like I don't know how you relate your topic to the web. Um, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> like, the, 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 the call for papers quite explicitly said we welcome contributions which aren't folk tied to the web, and um, I put in a contribution which wasn't tied to the web. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> I actually have a question for you. I really interesting paper. I was wondering how, um, how you think that people are creating, like, how you think that trans women are creating communities to, like, or what you see there and how that helps and how you would connect that to like feminized labor. So, um, hi, quick plug. I have a documentary coming out on trans women communities. Um, that's coming out August. Uh, it's about how we carve space out. Um, one of the recent things which I'm running into is often communities end up being trans women communities end up forming themselves into quite toxic and harmful spaces. Um, which doesn't allow the resistance like you do still get trans flats which um do resist carrying out domestic and caring labor to some extent but um you're always stuck in the same space carrying out the same labor for one another i'm not necessarily sure this is something which we resist like federici starts out in 75 talking about resisting domestic labor and then if you read her writings in the 2000s she's moving on to like venerating it seeing it seeing it as a site of revolutionary struggle and seeing it as something to be deeply embraced i'm less i agree with federici we kind of like we plan we counter plan from the kitchen and we take our domestic labor and we take what property and um build uh what's it called build through the storms of the chronic pain build in the storms of the chronic pain build out of trash um it's about taking what we have and 
making sure that's regarded as important and demanding that to be regarded as important. Obviously, like I said, the strike doesn't work. Um, but taking taking risks rather than resisting it is, I think, where I'm at. Any other questions? Comments? Anybody else on the panel want a closing remark? <laughs> <laughs> no? no? All right. Well, thank you to our panelists. I'm going to clap myself.